We are continuing our way through the book of Exodus. And last week we made it through Exodus 33, verses 12 through 23. And it's always important for us to go back, review what we talked about before we move forward with the verses this evening. That way we're keeping everything in its proper context. So again, last week we made our way through Exodus 33, verses 12 through 23. And if you want to go ahead... Tonight, we're going to be looking at Exodus 34, verses 1 through 7. Exodus 34, verses 1 through 7. But let's back up before we we move forward. So, last week, in those verses that we were studying, we saw that Moses was struggling with the concept that God was going to be with him, but not with the Israelites. There, There was a separation from God and the Israelites. That's what Moses was believing was going to happen. And why was he believing that? Because that's what God told him. Now, how did all this start? Well, if you recall, when Moses was on top of Mount Sinai, up there for the 40 days, 40 nights, receiving the instructions for the tabernacle, the furniture that would go in the tabernacle, and also in the courtyard of the tabernacle, he was also receiving the Ten Commandments. While this was taking place, what were the Israelites doing? They were building a golden calf to worship. And now this angered God, and and rightfully so. This angered Moses, and rightfully so, because when Moses went down, saw what was taking place, he took the Ten Commandments, the tablets, and he shattered them. So it was at that point, God told him, told Moses, I can no longer be around them, or I will consume them. Meaning the very sin, their, their rebellion against God and his commandments, God couldn't tolerate that. God is just, righteous, and holy. He would have to destroy them for their sins against him. So, it's in these verses that we covered last week that Moses is appealing to God. And he's saying, please don't give up on the Israelites. He even says to God, God, consider that this is your people, your nation. Don't don't leave them. Now, many, depending on which Christian camp you're in, uh, you have primarily there's two sides here. You have the those who believe in, in free will and those who believe in the sovereignty of God, and let me be careful when I say that, because even the free will people believe in the sovereignty of God. But on this side, so free willers here, then on this camp over here, that that being the Calvinists, we will believe the sovereignty of God and that everything is decreed. So, So that God doesn't learn. He's not learning. He's not surprised by any choices that are being made by man. He knows this already. He knows the beginning from the end. So although it seems to us, in in a sense when we read this, that that Moses is changing the mind of God, that's what the free willers will hold to, that Moses changed the mind of God. However, we don't hold to that on this side. And I'm not saying that they're, they're going to hell for their belief. I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm saying is we want to hold to what Scripture says. So although it seems as if God is reminding, I mean, Moses is reminding God of all these promises that the Israelites are his people. But that's not what's happening. This isn't to remind God. This is God developing the maturity in Moses. And this is also a warning to the Israelites. Again, this isn't Moses' opportunity to remind God of all the promises that he has made to the Israelites, therefore making God change his mind. No, 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 that's not what is taking place. Because God was never going to break his covenantal promise with the Israelites. He can't. He cannot break a promise. And I probably shouldn't say covenantal and promise together. That, that's... A bit redundant. But anyway, he's he's not going to break that promise, that covenant that he has made. Like I said, and if he did, he would no longer be God. So Moses wasn't changing the mind of God, nor was he reminding him of the 
things that he had already promised. And, and this is why we, on this side over here, the, the Calvinist, this is why we can't hold to what the free willers believe in, in the sense that, you know, God is learning. God's changing his mind depending on man's action. This is why we can't hold to that because we allow scripture from Genesis to Revelation reveal to us who God is. So look at Isaiah 46, 9 through 10. It says this, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. Now anywhere in those verses does it seem as if God has to have an understanding of what man is going to do before God can respond. No, not at all. It says here, verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. So no, God is not waiting on man. That's not how he works. Remember, when we speak of sovereignty, it is God who is sovereign, not man. Let's go to Psalm 139, verses 1 through 4. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. Again, no point in time is God waiting on man so that he can react, so that he can respond, so that he will be reminded. No. One more. Look at Isaiah 46.10. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from my ancient times things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. Now again, We've already talked about that, but that's extremely important that we let that sink in, that we have that understanding. Okay, now back to this conversation that's being had between Moses and God. Moses also says something else to God. He's like, God, what makes the Israelites different from any other nation on this planet. It's not their money. It's not their background. It's not their status. It's you. You are what separates the Israelites from all the other nations. Again, this is a maturing process for Moses. God already knows all this. God's decreed all this. He predetermined it to happen before the foundation of the world. It's at this moment in the conversation that God says, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Now, if you think about it, this conversation in a way, it's like a parent conversing with a child and the parent driving the child to the point that needs to be made. So, so it's the parent directing the child to the right conclusion. And the parent guiding them along the way. That's what God was doing with Moses and we, we, we recall last week how that conversation ended. Moses asked God if he could see his glory. What does God say? God says, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. So God covers the eyes of Moses, and he, placed them in between, and he places Moses in between two rocks. And at the right time, Moses take, I mean, God takes his hand from Moses' eyes. And what is it that Moses sees? It says his back. But we know that God has no um, physical attributes in the sense he, he has no human form. 
So more than likely, what Moses saw was just the glory of God passing by like a vapor trail. And that's all that he could see or else he would be killed by the holiness of God. So what is taking place in that moment where Moses craving to know God, craving to see God, and asking him, can, can I just see you? God gives him just a little glimpse. Why? Because God is protecting Moses from himself. God is protecting Moses from God. And we talked about this last week. We see this in our salvation. Every single one of us are sinners who have rebelled against God from birth. All of us deserve God's wrath being poured out upon us because we have sinned against God. And yet, what did God do? God sent his son to take the believer's sins upon himself that day on the cross 2,000 years ago. So, so when Jesus was hanging on that cross, enduring the wrath of God because of the believer's sins laid upon him, imputed to him. So we see right then and there, God is protecting the believer from God by way of his son. And we see a little bit of foreshadowing in this story with Moses when he asked to see the glory of God and yet God protects him, that being Moses, from himself. Okay, now we're going to be jumping into Exodus 34, verses 1 through 7. As you all know, I do not plan ahead when, when it comes to the, the scripture verses that we're going to be covering. I allowed the, the verses to do that themselves. I had every intention of doing verses 34, verses 1 through 16. And by the time I got to verse 7, I had 10 pages worth of notes. And I thought, okay, so 34 um, chapter 34, verses 1 through 7. That's what we're going to be covering this evening. Moses makes new tablets. Verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Cut for yourself two tablets of stone, like the first, and I'll write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Now this is interesting, but because the first time God gave Moses those tablets, the Ten Commandments, when he was up on Mount Sinai, while the Israelites were parting below, worshiping that horrendous golden calf, God gave Moses the commandments, and they were complete. The tablets, etched in stone, it was done. Tablets cut, words inscribed, but this time it's different. This time God tells Moses to bring the tablets. So Moses had to cut the stone. Moses had to carry the tablets up the mountain with him. And here's the thing, we're not certain why. We're not told why Moses had to cut and bring the tablets this time around. Now there is some speculation that, that because Moses had to cut the tablets, it could represent that these man-made tablets, remember because God had it all laid out for Moses last time, and this time, again, Moses is having to do it. But because these are now man-made tablets, that this would remind Israel of their sin. Because remember that the first tablets, Moses slammed on the ground and they shattered because the Israelites had rebelled against the commands of God. So it very well could be that by way of Moses making these tablets, they would be reminded of the first tablets that were made by God were destroyed because of their sin. We're not, we're not certain, but we do know that Moses has to bring his own tablets. So, even though we're not certain on why Moses is bringing those tablets, the one thing that we are certain on is that God is keeping his covenant with the Israelites. Even though the Israelites broke their end of the deal, 
Remember when the commands were given to the Israelites way back in Exodus? What did they say? We will do what you command of us, God. Well, that didn't last very long. They'd already broken the commandments, the first two especially. But we see here, God is still with them and God is giving them his laws yet again. Now, these are the exact same laws. Nothing is different. The only thing that's different is Moses is carrying the tablets to God this time. Now, let's pause for a second and let's jump ahead in the story because there's going to be some questions. And I'm hoping we can answer the question before we actually get to verse 24 of this chapter. Because in verse 24, again, remember, we're pausing and we're jumping ahead just for a moment, okay? And then we're going to come back to the story. But, but in verse 24 of this chapter, we're told that God told Moses what to write on the tablets. And maybe asking, well, that's not a big deal. Why, why are you going to that? Because many claim that there is a contradiction between verse 1 and verse 24 of this chapter. Because God said in verse 1, the one that we're covering right now, that he would write them down. Let's see. Let's go to this. Cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. So, so we have God saying he will write them on the first tablets. I mean on the tablets, right, that Moses is bringing up, the ones that he's cut. But in verse 24, we're told that Moses wrote them down. So, so the question is, well, which is right? Did, did God write them down or did Moses write them down? Well, technically speaking, both are correct. It's not a contradiction. It's a yes and yes. Moses did the writing or the actual writing or you could say chiseling this time around. But who was he inspired by? He was under the inspiration of God. There is no contradiction when it comes to the authorship of man being inspired by God. When we talk about scripture itself, who actually penned the word? Who authored it? Well, man penned it, but was not man inspired by the spirit while he was doing the writing? Yes. So it is a yes and yes. We go to the book of Romans. Think about it. And you may ask, who wrote the book of Romans? Now, we would all say the Apostle Paul. That's correct. But you know who else you could say? The Holy Spirit. Oh, yeah. So, oh, okay. Okay, that makes sense, right? So, so hopefully there, there's no contradiction here. Moses penned it, inspired by God. The same way the rest or the entire scripture, the Bible, is written. Man penned it, inspired by the Holy Spirit. So hopefully that clarifies any uh, questions that we may have when we get to verse 24. All right. The, the point is that the Ten Commandments were the divine commands from God to his people. Moses chiseled it, inspired by God, under the inspiration of God. Okay, so look at verse 2. Be ready by morning. And come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself to me there on top of the mountain. So once again, Moses would scale Mount Sinai to meet with God. And it goes something like this. Once he reaches the top at this specific place where they would meet, a glory cloud, that being God, the glory cloud would fall upon the mountain. And if you think about it, there's something else that we, we can see here. We, we, we're seeing Moses climbing the mountaintop, trying to get to, to, the, to the peak of the mountain. And, and no matter how high that mountain is that man may climb, no matter that peak, notice it's always God having to come down to meet with man. So man can always try and reach the highest point, and yet no matter the height, it's God bending down to man. 
And that's the way that we should always view God. He's up here, and man is way down here. I would go to the floor if I could. I'd go beneath the floor if I could just to to make this point, but you, you understand what I'm saying. God's home is in the heavenly realm. And man's home is here on the the fallen earth for the time being. Uh, Again, it's it's God coming down to meet with man. And this this time around, he's coming down again by way of this glorious cloud, also known as a theophany. We we discussed this uh, a couple of weeks back, a theophany being a visible manifestation from God. Again, not in a bodily form, but in a form that people are able to see. And, And he's chosen to come by way of a cloud. Now look at verse 3. No one shall come up with you, and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite that mountain. Now this should give us some sense of the holiness of God, that only the invited can stand before him. And who was invited? Moses. That's it. Out of all the Israelites, out of all the people on the earth... It's Moses who is able to stand before him. Again, he's not seeing the holiness of God. He's just in the form of this cloud. But no one else can even come close. So a stern warning was put out there to the people. And it's this. Don't even attempt to step foot on this mountain. Even the flock and herds of animals would fall over dead if they were to see God. And we have to understand that Mount Sinai, there there are plenty of places for for grazing. That's where the animals would go to graze. And then that's why God even says, let no flocks or herds graze opposite that mountain. Meaning, if you see the glory cloud of God meeting with Moses on the front side of the mountain, don't think that you can go around the back side for the animals to graze. No, no, no. His holiness is so great that it consumes the entire mountain. So even the animals, even if they can't see him on the backside, but because God is on top, they will die just by stepping foot on this place that he has made holy. So God's glory consumed the entire mountain. And this is one of the things that we as Christians need to keep at the forefront of our minds is the holiness of God. And sometimes I think we we lose that understanding. I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but I've, I've heard believers come to me when they're going through a rough time and they're angry. And they say, you know, when I get to heaven, Brit." I'm going to have a few choice words for God. It's like, no, you're not. No, you're not. You'll be on your face worshiping the Holy of Holies. For you to sit there and think that you can approach God and let him have it, I'm afraid you're not grasping the concept of his holiness. Let us, not lose a, let us not lose the grip on that. Even during those trying times, even those times where you're upset and you're mad, please, please, please don't ever say that you're going to approach God when you get to heaven and have a few words for him. It should never cross our minds to think that we can call out the very one who rescued us. Keep that in mind. Now look at verse 4. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first, and he rose early in the morning and went up on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand two tablets of stone. What are we witnessing here in this verse? Moses Obeying the commands of God. Moses didn't say to God, yes, God, I will cut those stones and I will bring those. 
and then show up, top of the mountain, glory cloud coming down upon him, and him looking up and saying, you know what, God, I know I said I was going to do that, but I, I just didn't. I just didn't. No, no, no. What we see is Moses, the believer, doing exactly what God commanded him to do. And this is what a follower is supposed to do. They are now able to fondly follow the commands of God. It's not just lip service. And and often, believers, this is the way you treat it. As lip service. No action. No following the commands of God. Or you you pick and choose the commands you want to follow. The actions that you want to put forth those efforts in. You're picking and choosing. But you can tell a lot about a Christian by the conversations they have. And, and this is what I mean. This is why I'm going with something simple. When we talk about the larger commands of God, stealing, murder, adultery, you know, those, those are kind of the biggies that we hold to, not worshiping other gods. But when it comes to our everyday life, our everyday language, the conversations that we have, is there anything different when when it comes to the dialogue that you have with another believer? I mean, because there there should be. Or are your conversations like the world? Are your conversations filled with sexual innuendos? Because that's like the world. And this is a command from God that you should not be having those types of conversations. Look at Ephesians 5.4. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. See, a follower isn't just about lip service. Nor are they about just following through on the the big commands that they hold to. No, it's following all of the commands of God. It's dying to self daily. But Moses, doing exactly what he was commanded to do, took the tablets, cut them himself, And went up the mountain. Look at verse 5. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Now, Now remember when it mentions standing, God wasn't standing with Moses. This is just an anthropomorphic term helping us to understand that with the glory cloud being there, they were close. God was with Moses. And this takes us back to when Moses asked to see God's glory. God only gave him a glimpse, and we understand why, because the fullness of his glory would kill Moses. So he just got a glimpse as as the glory passed him by that that little vapor trail. So what is it that God is going to do here in this conversation that he's about to have with Moses? He's going to let Moses know that it's not important for Moses to know what God looks like. What's important is that he knows who God is meaning the attributes of God. This is what's important. Do you know me, Moses? Which is why he proclaimed his name as Lord. And what does he do next? He then goes to give the understanding of that name. So it's here on top of the mountain 
where God truly reveals himself to Moses, not physically, but by way of knowing him. And listen, we as believers today, we, we need to hear this. We need to, we need to have this same understanding that, that it's not important to know what God looks like, but to know God is to know his attributes. Look at verse 6. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Three times in one verse, God gives his name. Lord, Lord, Lord. God was emphasizing his name to Moses. He wasn't stuttering. No, he was putting great emphasis on his name. He's telling Moses, this is my sacred name. For those who still use the Bible and I would encourage people to mark in their Bible, make notes in their Bible. This is one of those places. I would definitely say, mark this verse. This is one of those verses that that should be etched in the heart of every believer. Look at what he's saying. The Lord God is merciful. What is this mercy that he's speaking of? It's a love that responds to human need in an unexpected or unmerited way. It's not deserved. It's not worked for. It's just given by God by way of his mercy. He also says, the Lord is gracious Gracious, God doesn't give the believer what they deserve, which is punishment for our sins. His wrath should be poured out upon us because we've rebelled against him. No, what God gives us is something that we don't deserve, which is the gift of his grace. And with that gift of grace comes the gift of faith. And again, that's not based on anything that you have done. No. It's based on everything he has done for us. Next, God says, the Lord is slow to anger. Thankfully, God is patient. God never loses his cool, never flies off the handle for when his anger comes forward and his wrath is taken out upon the sinner, it is righteous and just, not too late, not too soon. It's in his perfect timing. But think about this patience God is speaking of with the Israelites. He rescues them from Egypt, the Egyptians, I should say. They were enslaved to the Egyptians for 400 plus years. God rescues them, pulls them out into the wilderness, told them that he's taken them to the promised land. God has made them his people. He's feeding them. He's providing for them. And they whine and they whine. He gives them a mediator by way of Moses so that there is a person that can can communicate with God and those people can communicate with Moses. And and so here, there's the mediator that God's given his people. God plans on building a tabernacle so that he can dwell within the midst of his people. Has to pull Moses away for a couple of days, but what do they do? 
build a golden calf and worship it. You see the patience of God with the Israelites. Now just think about your own life. Just let that roll through your head for a bit. Think about how patient he's, how patient he's been with you. God says, the Lord is abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. This is, this is absolutely amazing. And if you think about it too long, it, it makes my head hurt. I don't, I don't know what it does for you guys, but those two brain cells I have, they just are in a constant battle. But the Lord is abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And this is referring to his children, his elect, his chosen His love will never leave them. His promise will always stand. Even though his own are saints, while we're still here, we are still sinners. And yet no sin will make God turn his back on his child. His love and faithfulness is abounding and is unlimited Just think about that. The very God that we've rebelled against, he's loved us before the beginning of time. If you're one of his own, there was never a time when he was going to say that you are not his. Look at verse 7. Keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Keeping steadfast love for thousands. What is this referring to? It's referring to thousands of generations to come. Now, not literally. This is figurative speak. In a sense, it means a lot. A lot upon a lot. We have to understand what this is saying. Again, God knew his own before the foundation of the world. And here he's telling Moses, now not only do I love my people, the Israelites that are before me now, in the present, but I also love the ones who haven't been born yet. I love the one who are a hundred years away, two hundred years away, a thousand years away, two thousand years away, four thousand years away. For I know my own, and my love for them is already, even though they have not breathed their first breath. I know them, and I love them. That's how. God's covenant works. It's the forever promise. And his love is like no other. It knows no time. And it endures always and can never be taken away. And he says here, not only is he loving, but he is forgiving. And the Hebrew definition for forgiveness means to lift or to carry And that's what God does with the believer's sins. He lifts that sin from them and he carries it far away. But understand who's doing the work. He lifts and he carries it. That being the believer's sins far away. He does it because he is a loving God who forgives. Now, it even says what he forgives. He forgives our iniquities. What is that? That's our wickedness. Which, what is wickedness? It's kind of helpful if we understand what iniquity and wickedness means. They're interchangeable. You see that happen depending on which translation of the Bible you're reading. 
but iniquity or wickedness. It means to turn aside from what is right and good. And in the beginning, that's what natural fallen man does. They turn from what is good. And yet God forgives this. God forgives his children of their iniquity. He also says he forgives our transgression. He forgives the believer's defiance towards his command. Remember earlier what I said, uh, iniquity and wickedness. What, what is that? It's those who turn aside from what is right and good. But transgression is a little bit harsher. A transgression is to deliberately rebel against the commands of God. And he forgives that. He forgives his children of their transgression. And then it says he forgives sin. That being an immoral act. So God forgives all the wicked, rebellious, and sinful acts against him. When it comes to those who have faith in him. And when it comes to his elect, his chosen, the predestined. What we're seeing here with the Israelites and what God is saying to Moses is that the Israelites are serving a God that they did not deserve. We serve the same God and we don't deserve him either. Now many will stop right here and they'll, they'll just say, okay, these are the attributes of God. And that's a shame. For we as believers should hold to the entirety of God. All the attributes of God. That's what makes him God. We can't just pick the parts we like and leave out the rest. That's what we call heresy. And and think about this too. Think about this too. How arrogant is it of us, the created, to pick and choose the parts that we like of the creator? That's sin in itself. That's wickedness in itself when we do something like that. How arrogant is it of us, the the, the created, to call out the creator? For was it not the creator who rescued us? And yet we think that we can tell God the attributes that we like of his, and those are the ones that we're going to hold to and not tell about the other ones. So thankful God is patient. All right, finishing up on verse seven. Here's the part that many don't like or they'll they'll try to make an excuse for it. But who will by no means clear the guilty? Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on their children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. So yes, one of the attributes of God is forgiveness. And it's a wonderful, beautiful attribute. But another attribute of God is his just wrath. That is beautiful and wonderful as well. The guilty will be punished. For if the guilty were not punished, then God could not be God. For God is perfect. And he has said that every sin shall be punished. Now, here's where some folks have some issues. Because they they, they say, wait a minute. How is he forgiving and also at the same time punishing others for their sins? 
Is this not a contradiction? Some will try to resolve it by stating that the Old Testament God is of justice and wrath and that the New Testament Jesus is of love and peace. But I say, how dare any believer say anything of the sort? I mean, we've just been told by the word that God is forgiving. And yet, what some people want to do to, to reconcile this issue is say, no, 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 the, the God of the Old Testament, again, is about wrath and justice. But did it not just say that he is forgiving? And in the New Testament, does Jesus not condemn the religious leaders? And did he not rebuke the Jews for their sins? And then what did he do with Judas? Just go and look at what Jesus says about Judas. Listen, oh believer, you should never take God the Father and the Son and put them in opposition of each other. We should never do that. God the Father, the Son, never be in opposition of each other. The Word doesn't allow it. And if the Word doesn't allow it, then neither should we. So the question is then asked, so then how do we resolve this issue? And I say the res issue has already been resolved by the cross 2,000 years ago. When Jesus was hanging on that cross, what was he doing? He was dying to make atonement for the believer's sins. The cross was the justice for the believer's sins. But for those whose faith is not in Christ, they must pay for their rebellion. They must, they must pay for their sin and God's wrath will be poured out upon them. For God cannot let the guilty go without punishment. All of us are guilty. The only difference is, is who has been atoned for. All of us deserve the wrath of God. The only difference is, is who paid your sin debt. If Christ did not pay for your sin debt, then you will pay for it. That's how this is resolved. For the believer whose faith is in Christ, 2,000 years ago, God's wrath was poured out upon the Son. For those whose faith isn't in Christ, on that day of judgment, God's wrath will be poured out upon you for eternity. That's how it's resolved. Now, here comes another question when it comes to verse 7. What about this family part? How is it fair that the children's children's children will also be punished? For the sins of the generation before them. During the ancient times, family would stay close. They would even continue to live with one another throughout their entire lives. So many of the evil attributes of the father would be passed down to his son. And that son would continue in that same sinful lifestyle and pass it down to his son. These generations were continuously rebelling against God. Why? Because at some point in time, the father 
I'm talking about the earthly father, started this rebellion. And the sins continued through the line because that's what the father taught. That's why when it speaks of the generations being punished, it's because the generations continuously rebelled against God. Church, are we not thankful that we serve a God who is compassionate, sympathetic, forgiving, And we see all this by way of the cross. And yet, church, are we not thankful that we serve God who is just and who pours out his wrath on the wicked? We should love every attribute about God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your word. We are thankful for your truth. Lord, we are thankful that you have regenerated our hearts so that when we come to the word, when we hear the word, we believe it, we hold to it. And because of what you have done by giving us the Holy Spirit, by him dwelling within us, not only do we see this truth for what it is, but we can now follow it. We can put it into action. And we couldn't do that before, not with our rebellious hearts, but because of everything that you have done. We can now strive to be more Christ-like. God, again, we are so thankful for the words that you have given us by way of you in those words revealing yourself to us. We say these things in your son's holy name. Amen.